everyone. Um, welcome to the Mind of Dave Study. My name is Sarah Gordon. Um, um, so I know this is the last session after I think many in a row, so we'll be trying to make this a little more interactive. Um, the topic today is pro slavery rabbis, rabbinic debates from the Civil War. Um, so I thought what we would do is we take a we take a look at um, a few different speeches, a few different writings of different rabbis from the Civil War period. I think it's kind of very fascinating topic. Hearing about this topic of slavery, something that today, um, at least I would assume, right, all of us are kind of against. Um, but if you look back in the day, some of our you know, rabbinic leaders is it's a little bit of a controversy. People um, expressing opinions, kind of pro-slavery, trying to use. Um, parts of Tanakh or part of the Bible to kind of support their opinions. I uh, thought we'd have a chance to kind of look at this um, together. We're trying to make it interactive. Um, and again, please feel free to share your thoughts um, and ideas as we go through the, as we go through some of these sources. Um, a few things just kind of um, as background. Um, first of all, I think just to talk a little bit before we start about kind of uh, Jews and slavery in general. So there's a lot of kind of books and articles being written about this. Um, I gave you kind of a bibliography at the end if you want to kind of continue doing some research on your own after that, you're welcome to do so. Um, but again, um, first of all, Jews in general, I think it's important to just talk a little about Jews who live in the north and Jews who live in the south. Um, Jews who live in the south, um, part of kind of assimilating into southern culture was kind of buying in to a certain extent to this culture of slavery. Um, at least from different books, at least from, from different research, it seems that Jews did own, own slaves. Not a lot did. They didn't really kind of affect so much the slave trade. But owning slaves for Jews in the south was a little bit just kind of um, part of kind of accepting that culture. Um, and Jews in general in the South, just because, again, a little more of the white versus black divide, Jews being white usually had kind of more of a, kind of like a, a higher status in the South than they did in the North. The North, as kind of like immigrant outsiders, they always kind of had to, to fight a little bit more. So again, Jews in the South kind of would accept. Session two oh, of the Day of Study is starting now. Session two of the Day of Study is starting now. Um, so again, kind of Jews in the South, this was just part of kind of um, except in this culture is similar a little bit more into the South, and we'll see this in kind of some of the sources that um, that we go through. Um, so that's kind of just one thing to, I guess, always debate, you know, how many slaves and Jews on the South. So again, not many, it didn't really affect it um, too much. Um, and just a few kind of points before we kind of look at these sources in general, a few more points of kind of introduction. Um, first of all, kind of by this point in the 1860s, most people had kind of made their minds up on how they felt about slavery. So even though we're looking at kind of the opinions of the rabbis, the rabbis here weren't really the leaders. They were kind of more the followers, followers. Meaning it was more kind of people just decided what they thought. So the kind of opinions of the rabbis here were more showing a little bit just what the opinions of the people were. And the other thing is kind of the difference, or even today, between let's say the American Jewish community and the uh, even Jewish community in Israel is we don't really have a chief rabbi of America. So that's kind of uh, another discussion about why we may not have that. Um, but again, there wasn't really kind of one person speaking for all the Jews of America at that time with kind of like their opinion of slavery. And that's kind of why when someone does, and we'll see what our first source, try to kind of give a very set opinion, there's a lot of kind of pushback um, from that. So that's again just kind of a few kind of points of introduction. Um, so I thought what we would start off doing was talking a little bit about um, uh, basically a speech given by Rabbi Morris Jacob Raphael. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background to that. This is basically our first source. Um, basically, in 1861, there was a day of fasting and prayer that was uh, proclaimed by President James Buchanan, um, kind of again to try to probably stave off everything that was going to take place or the war that, that was coming. Um, and Rabbi Raphael gets up in this uh, synagogue in New York. There's a little background about him. He was born in Sweden, went to Germany, um, England, came to New York. Um, he was again more of a traditional Orthodox, Orthodox rabbi, and he gave a basic speech saying the biblical view um, on slavery. He gives a speech, later on it's published as like a pamphlet, and he, all of a sudden he kind of gets this title as being the pro-slavery rabbi. And so I like this, to do, and again, and people, um, again, it leads to a lot of people kind of writing uh, responses to different rabbis again, such as whole controversy. So what I like this to do is just to kind of, first let's start and look at the text, and we'll look at a lot of these texts together um, for the time that we have, and try to figure out, first of all, really what exactly are his main points? Does he really seem to be so pro-slavery or not? And kind of what seem to be the, the general ideas that are coming out of this? And one of the things I think we'll see when we look at the different um, texts that are coming out is how basically the background and also the, um, the different ideology of different rabbis really kind of affected their views on slavery, whether it be reform versus orthodox, whether it be that you lived in the north versus living in the south, and also people who sometimes um, had come from Europe and had a little bit more exposure to different revolutions, how exactly they felt also about the abolitionists and how they felt in general about this process. Um, and one final thing also, we'll see versus the, the main kind of issue that's going to kind of come up as we look through these texts as well, is kind of slavery versus the union. 
Is it that you know slavery is so terrible, slavery is this terrible injustice that's worth going to war over? And even this means, especially as Jews, where we have this position of privilege in the United States, where we're protected as a minority, we're protected in this democracy, um, is it worth kind of risking all of that and risking the union in order to get rid of slavery? Or do we say no, maybe as Jews, that especially our, our position here is you know so protected in the United States that we're not fans of slavery, but maybe we'll tolerate it in order to kind of continue the union. The most important thing, or the, the ICAR, is the United States continue, and that kind of would, or that would kind of come first over any type of um, opposition. Even if we're opposed to slavery, we're not going to kind of go to war. And we'll see kind of how that, that comes to play. Okay, so a lot of uh, introduction, and now we'll have a chance to look at some of the sources. So, does anyone want to volunteer? Read. Okay. <laughs> a lot of us. Uh, yes, go for it, Kira. So I, we're going to start. We'll start with the second paragraph. Um, and basically, here he, he starts off with a little longer speech, and he goes into kind of like the, the history of slavery, trying to show that it was really rooted in the Bible, rooted in, in, in Tanakh. So let's start with paragraph two, and we'll start with the beginning. So having having thus, having thus traced slavery back to the remotest period, I next request our attention to the question: Is slaveholding a sin in sacred scripture? How such a question can, all, can at all arise in the mind of any man who has received a religious education that is acquainted with the history of the Bible is a phenomenon, phenomenon that I cannot explain to myself. Even on that most solemn and most holy occasion, slave holding is not only recognized and sanctioned as an integral part of the social structure, but it is commanded that the Sabbath of the Lord is to bring rest to Abba Tzachah of Amos Adam, and a male slave and a female slave. Okay, so we'll pause here for a second. What seems to be kind of some of the main, what's the main point that he seems to be making in this paragraph? Uh, yeah. Slavery is an integral part of any social structure. Really good, right? Slavery is an integral part of any social structure. What else do you think he's doing in this paragraph? What's he trying to, to kind of connect? Yeah. I think he's trying to connect the, like he's trying to connect, like, like say that it's not a sin, right? Like he's trying to put but words of the Bible to sanction, not to sanction, to approve of. Good, right? And I think that what we're seeing here is, I mean, we'll see lots of different rabbis try to do this with, they all try to kind of fit the, right, the, words of the scripture and so the opinion that they're having, but here he's trying to show that slavery really is rooted in, in Tanakh. Like we have it, it tells us, you know, for Shabbat, you have to let your, your servant, your slave rest. This is part of kind of the, the institution um, of the Torah. It's kind of, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of part of that. Okay, so that's one kind of thing approach, which is slavery sanctioned by the Bible. Um, but now he goes on to kind of, I think it's interesting to think about the tone that he's taking as we, as we continue on in the third kind of paragraph over here. So Kira, thank you for reading. Someone else want to take over? Um, go for it. How dare you, in the face of the sanction and protection afforded to slave property in the Ten Commandments, how dare you denounce slave holding as a sin? When you remember that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Job, the Mr. men... Mr. Weinberger, please let us know where your physics class is meeting. ...with whose names he emphatically connects his own most holy name and to whom he vouchsafed to, to give the character of perfect, upright, fearing God and issuing evil that all these men are slave holders. Does it not strike you that you are guilty of something very little short of blasphemy? And if you answer me, oh, in their time, slaveholding was lawful, but now it has become a sin. I, in my turn, ask you when and by what authority you draw the line. Tell us the precise time when slaveholding ceased to be permitted and became sinful. Okay. Thank you, Becky. So here we see kind of already, all right, Ralph, he's on kind of a more, I think, uh, intense tone over here. He's kind of making a couple of points. So any thoughts, what seems to be kind of like the points that he's making now? That he's shown slavery seems to be sanctioned by the Bible. What, what are kind of the accusations that he's making? Thoughts, yeah. Like at what point did, um, you know, having a slave that is written in the, in the Torah text, that you can't be counted as like when do you become like a sin to have one? Good. Right now, one of the points that we're going to see here, and I think this is also kind of we'll see a little bit of a, the Orthodox versus Reform kind of ideology. It's going to come out from a different kind of machloka um, um, here, a different kind of debates that are going on. Is at what point he's basically saying, at what point does slavery become become a sore? At what point does slavery kind of become um, forbidden? What time do you stop taking the Bible literally, right? Tanakh or the Bible here seems to be saying that it's a, don't worry, I'm not for slavery, but we'll just you know, go for it now. But at what point, right, the Bible here seems to be saying that we're supposed to, that or that slavery is fine. Um, and again, as, as, as Becky read for us, he's saying that at what point, um, at what point are we saying, oh, in their time, slave voting was lawful, but now it has become a sin. I think he's referenced over here a lot of time the Orthodox Reform debate that has been going on where, and again, we'll see though how exactly how, how Reformist ideology is unclear, but there's one idea that if we see kind of troubling texts or if we see kind of um, parts of, of the Torah that, that, you know, that, that seem to 
um, not jive well maybe with, with, with certain values. You know, I think that we'll see later on, especially in time for a bit of earlier in the Gemara, this is something that we do also in Orthodox circles. But again, at least from the position that he's coming from here, is that to say it, that we're not going to take slavery literally, or, oh, it applied back then, but it doesn't apply anymore, that really sounds like what? It's really kind of a more, more kind of a, a reform, reform ideology that he's really coming against. And we can't say that we don't take these things literally. You might not like it, it's in the Bible, and that's kind of what we have to go with. But he's making, I think, another another point also. And what's that? Or, yeah. I think he's trying to take the argument out from his own opinion and trying to attribute it directly to the Bible and saying that you can't argue with it, that essentially it's not... Uh, and not something that uh, is up for debate. Right, correct. We're kind of rooting it kind of into that text. Um, any other thoughts about this, uh, about this paragraph? So I, yeah. I'm just bothered by Raphael, uh use or belief that the word ebed is equated with slavery as a practice in the United States mm -hmm. at that time pre-Civil War. I'm not sure that's the case. Right, well, we'll actually see soon in the, the next few paragraphs, he talks a little about how I mean, what the South could do to kind of bring it in line. But did he really think what was going on in the South was kind of like what the Torah believed slavery should be? That's, that's a good point. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I noticed on your list of sources um, for people to read is Jonathan Sarner's book, yeah. which deals excellently with this. And I think that it's important, not important, it's helpful to not divorce what's happening in the pulpits with what's happening sociologically throughout the United States. Right. There weren't very many Jews. There certainly weren't, at least my ancestors weren't here at that time. Um, there were what some Sephardim left from like the very early days and it was starting to be some German Jews coming over, not Eastern European. And the fear that he brought out that I had never thought of till I read his book that there was concern that if the slaves were free, um, the abolitionists were very Christian, very right. Christian oriented, that they would have like more Christians and they would have the opportunity to turn on their old friends, us. And I think it's important to see that Ma while on the one hand he's certainly looking for religious sources and how to look at it and how um, taking the Bible literally or not, it's also important to think about what was going on in America at the time. Right, for sure. Thank you for bringing it up. And I think you're right. There really was this tremendous kind of distrust almost of abolitionists, of kind of like their motives and, and coming from that approach as well. Um, the one thing I would add in kind of this paragraph also is I think that this kind of idea, like who, who are we to say that the Avots were sinners? Right? The Avot had, the Avot had slaves, this is what they did. This is how it was, was rooted part of our, our culture back in the day. And who are we to say that we're better than the Avot? So again, yeah, kind of think like some harsh, some harsh statements over here. Uh, I want to kind of keep reading a little bit more, and I think that also this gets into I think, the, the last point that was made in the next paragraph, this idea that kind of isn't worth going to war kind of over this. And again, like who are we, who are we aligning ourselves with? Who are who are these abol abolitionists, right, that are, are pushing us to go to war over this issue? If not, if it's not even a sin, according to the Bible, is it even worth kind of now starting this whole war over it? Um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read from a little bit. If we look at the next paragraph, the bold part where it's bolded in section not four, what right have you to insult and exasperate thousands of God-fearing, law-abiding citizens whose moral worth and patriotism, whose purity of conscience and of life are equal to your own? What right have you to place yonder gray-haired philanthropist on a level with a murderer, or yonder mother of family on a line with an adulteress? Right? Who are we to say that all these people who own slaves are suddenly kind of unethical people? They're, you know, I'm going to go. Are we really going to go to war over this? Um, later on, it's the people were, were kind of um, saying, "One second, we're a little we'll throw by this." And really, you know, did Raphael really know kind of the extent of what was going on in slavery in the South? Like, did he really know how bad it was? And maybe that was a little unclear. Maybe he didn't realize kind of the extent to which um, how terrible slavery really was. Right. 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 What, what we, um, what sections in the Bible uh, with regard to slavery is, is completely, completely different than what's going on in the South there, there night and day. So right, no, it's not the same thing. Right, and yeah. we'll, we'll see actually the next, the next part that we're going to move on to now is also about how we, we don't always kind of be, be telling the South, at least if you put, and again, but I think, I think it, again, you're right, like maybe how did you not realize? But I think, again, it, it's, it's very shocking to read this and, and not kind of feel, you know, how, like, what was going on really was so terrible, like how could anything kind of justify, you know, continuing with that, with that can, system? Can you, can you imagine trying to, to tell a s southern plantation owner that if you really want to do this right, sir, um, if there's one bed and you're um, 
you know, traveling with your slave, uh, you sleep on the floor and he sleeps in the bed. Right. That's going to happen? Right. Probably not. Uh, no, these are these are also these are good points. Um, but hang on, if you have a few questions or ideas, yeah, tell well, was Rafael, um was he defending Jews who owned slaves or just general collective like Christians? He was and talking Jews just in general owned. about slavery. Like, I'm not speaking I'm not speaking specifically to Jews, but he was talking then to the Jewish audience, but kind yeah. of like in general to everyone. Um, okay, so if we turn it, or, yeah, sorry, anyway. I was thinking it is possible, that, considering he's from New York, that he didn't necessarily know the, the extent of how they treated slaves. No. I mean, because slaves in the North were not treated as unfairly. Right. There, there wasn't was the mass type of, like, hundreds of thousands of slaves. Right, well, there was, I mean, this, I don't was, know, was, this was one point that I had read in one of the books that said that maybe he didn't not really, I mean, it's you know, understand what's going on, but I, I do hear that it's, it's hard to, it's hard to kind of put that into context, yes. Was he a copperhead? Was he, you know, during the course of the war, was he aligned with So, that actually, once the war breaks out, he supports the Union, and his son goes to fight for the Union, and his son actually loses an arm fighting for the Union. So, at, at the end, he really does come around to um, defending, defending kind of like that that side, but at this point, it seems like maybe he didn't know what was going on. That's, uh, that's a good point. Yeah? To support what Naima said, like, he, <laughs> he might have have heard about what was going on and stuff, but he was, he was only going to be hearing about northern media sources. And, so, and media always twists the message to fit their agenda. He could have been critical of the messages he was receiving and saying, they're saying this to make us angry. They don't, that's not necessarily what's actually going on. I think, I think it's a, essentially right, I think it's, it's very unclear kind of like, maybe again, like going back to what he knew or what he didn't know, I think coming to, to both points, like how could maybe, how would he not know like how terrible this is and, and still say these points. Um, okay, so I wanna, I wanna kind of move on. If you turn the page over, um, he actually goes on his um, long kind of truck off over here. Um, and he talks a little bit about making a split between basically um, the institution of slavery as it's talked about in Hamash and basically what's going on in the South. And he basically talks about, essentially he splits between Evan Knani and Evan Ivory. Um, so essentially he doesn't really deal so much with Evan Knani. Almost that he leaves us like there for Evan Knani. You can basically do whatever or whatever you want to do to, to those type of slaves, which again is a little bit, a little bit disturbing. Um, but for an Evan Ivory, he talks about again how, um, again, I think it was mentioned before, right, all the different laws that we have concerning the way that uh, we have to treat Evan Ivory. Right, the Ravon talks about right anyone who took on like a, a slave, right? It's, it's almost like you've taken on a master, like all the different rules you have to have in order to treat um, your slaves kind of with respect. And he talks, I just bold this part of the end, right? He says, in fact, between the Hebrew bondman and the southern slave, there's no point of resemblance. And the point that he's basically making here is that ideally, if you would take the institution of slavery as a Torah basically really wants you wants you to, to observe it, this is not what's going on really in the South. And really, kind of, we should be treating our slaves. And, and if you want to have slavery, that's fine, but treat them the way basically the Torah wants you wants you to treat. Again, so if you look in the section um, seven, kind of in the towards the bottom, which is bolded again, the slave is a person whom the dignity of human nature is to be respected. He has rights. Whereas the, the heathen view of slavery, which prevailed in Rome, or which I'm sorry to say is adopted in the South, produces a slave to a thing, and a thing can have no rights. Um, and basically, I think kind of one of the, the points that he's talking about over here is again, it was like, like I, I wouldn't call it a rebuke, I don't think it's very harsh language, but I think saying that, you know, almost like he, he would wish that the South would, would, would come into line with kind of what slavery really should be, really should be, um, really should be practiced. Yes? I don't think he's he's holding out the Hebrew bondsman as the parallel to the American slavery. He's acknowledging that the Hebrew bondsman is not really a slave, and he's saying we need to compare the heathen slave of the Jews with the slaves in the South, and he's saying even on that measure, it's not comparable. Because like that, he hasn't mentioned it specifically. I don't know what's in the missing section, but like if you hit a slave and his tooth comes right. out, he goes free. Right. So whereas Dred Scott held that. You know, a slave is not a citizen, he's property. Right. Judaism holds that a non Jewish slave, a heathen slave, is a citizen. Right. So I, I don't think he's arguing that, you know, biblical slavery right. should apply to the rules of the Hebrew bonds. I think he's. he's Basing himself on the rules of the Okay, no, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, I think also, if we look, um, can we bring this all together? What what are kind of like the takeaways of this kind of piece? Look at the end. It seems that in general, look the second uh, second last paragraph over here. Uh, actually, if someone else want to want to read, volunteers. Um, okay, they even go for it. So, so starting from, if our northern fellow citizens, if our northern fellow citizens content with following the word of God, and not insist on being righteous over much or denouncing sin which the Bible knows not, they would entertain more equity and less ill-feeling towards their southern 
brethren. And if our southern fellow citizens would adopt the Bible view of slavery and discard the heathen slave code, which permits a few bad men to indulge in an abuse of power that throws the disgrace on the whole body of slaveholders, if both north and south would do what is right, then God would mercifully avert the impending evil, for with him alone is the power to do so. Okay, and so I think this is kind of like his kind of closing paragraph, which I don't want to like, summarize, or what seems to be kind of like his main, his main takeaways here. Or it's like closing. We could all come to the middle. We could have, God would make the war not go forward. Good, right? Let's, let's try to try to avert the, the war. But basically, both sides have to kind of, um, yeah, what I was saying, exactly. If I'm a little bit closer to the middle, the, the southerners have to stop, sorry, the people in the north have to stop calling the southerners sinners because there's a sanction in, in the Bible. How can you call them sinners? And on the other side, people in the south should, should kind of, you know, bring their, their slave practice a little bit more in line to, to, again, a little bit away from kind of what they're doing, the, 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 the heathen uh, slave code, and bring them a little bit more closer to what should be happening. So again, kind of, but again, I think that, like we see overall, is that you're, uh, we must kind of uh, avert this war. And it's not, maybe, maybe it's not even worth kind of going to war over this can kind of be um, avoided. And say one more comment, then we'll see kind of the, the huge reactions that this um, sermon later on pamphlet um, evoked, basically, in the American uh, Jewish community. Yeah. Does the New Testament ever talk about like, slavery in general? That's an interesting question. I'm not, that, a, I'm not really an expert in the New Testament. I don't know if someone else can, uh, can answer that. But. <laughs> so, like, how would like, Southern people, like, like or whatever, sinners? Right, so I, I think. Where is that, how is that, where is that derived from? Right, so I mean, I think here they were kind of, as you mentioned, they were kind of looking back into the Old Testament. They still kind of, you know, look at those, those verses. For the New Testament, it's a good question, I'm not sure. Um, but we try to look it up after, try to find if you go away to know more about that. Um, okay, so if you turn the page over, turn to page number three, um, this basically sparks a, a very big um, kind of outcry, um, especially as we said before, as there wasn't really one voice for the American Jewish community at that point. And again, it's very, very small, different scattered um, parts. People really felt that, especially now, you know, there's like a, a rabbi getting up and claiming to speak with uh, you know, the voice of uh, uh, or pro, pro slavery. There was really these responses. Um, that evoked. So one of these responses, well, we'll look for a couple of them. Um, Michael Helfrin, he was a reformed Jewish uh, scholar, a linguist, and an editor. Um, he published uh, an editorial in New York Tribune, kind of against or responding kind of directly um, to Rabbi Raphael's um, piece. Um, so we'll kind of like just read through a, a few parts over here. Um, kind of the main points that he says over here, he starts at the beginning, um, again, kind of like very, very harsh language, right? Must the stigma of Egyptian principles be fast on the people of Israel by Israelitish lips themselves? Meaning, right, in, in uh, kind of like regular English, uh, this idea that how can we, you know, we were, we were free from Israel, like how can we suddenly come and like act like Egyptians? Like how can we come all of a sudden, like we the people who we should be the most sensitive to the plight of the slaves, start coming and, and having this, this approach where we're, we're again almost seeing to be pro-slavery. Um, and he goes on a little bit more and almost like responding to this idea that Rabbi Raphael had been talking about before, but said here of Evan, and he says that we do talk about Abadim in, in Tanakh, but the only kind of appropriate term to talk about Evan, he talks about when we talk about Evan Hashem. And it's kind of the second paragraph that again, like Abraham is called the Evan of the Lord, so are Moses, Job, Isaiah, Cyrus, Jacob, Rachel as a nation. That really this is kind of one of the main, uh, or this is kind of like the only time that it's kind of seems appropriate. Um, and as, as we go on, here kind of like he continues his uh, attack of Rabbi Raphael. Um, so I'm going to take over reading, paragraph 3. Uh, okay, go for it, Ellen. But after all, the rabbi may say, have I not proved that Moses allowed slavery to out people? Not at all, because he substitutes slaves for servants or bondmen without authority. Lastly, there is nothing sufficient to pass in the reproach of Egypt on the law of the great fugitive slave who inaugurated his divine mission as liberator of the people of slaves by slaying one of their overseers, and who to the end of his career repeated over and over again, forget not that ye have been slaves in Egypt. An eye for an eye is written in the plainest of words in the same law. Still you hold with all the Talmudists that this is not to be understood literally. Okay. Um, so I want to kind of talk about this paragraph for a second, especially that last line about how we don't take an eye for an eye literally. So, so what seems to be kind of another kind of argument here that Hell Prince bringing up? Yeah. Well, we clearly don't take everything that's not literally. If we don't take that literally, so why should we take the idea, the idea that other unimportant people have not had slaves uh, okay. as a 
example for us. Good, and I think this gets back to, yeah, we said before, like kind of one of the ways of kind of viewing this, or one of, obviously there's many kind of things that are going into the, the backgrounds of people who are involved in writing these articles, but one thing also, again, coming from this perspective, that there's lots of things in the in the Torah, you know, or as well, we see this in the Gemara, that we don't take literally. Like it says an eye for an eye, or if the Gemara Bible comma says that we don't take that literally, it really was an eye for an eye mean. Like, right, that's how you you take it with a monetary monetary fine instead. But I think this idea that you know how do we view kind of literal troubling texts in the Bible, right? Is this something that we reinterpret? Is this something that we have a tradition of kind of um, trying to reframe it in, in different ways? Um, so again, um, and again, so I think he's coming here from uh, what Raphael was responding to before. Like, uh, tell me at what point that slavery suddenly became permitted. And now, right, how kind of putting a different lens. Like, there's lots of times when we kind of don't take these literally and kind of reappropriate these or, or these different texts. Um, yes. Okay. Back to both of these, I just um, googled the the first rabbi. Yeah. It's very interesting to see what happened because after he made the speech, which apparently became famous, and then he made it before non-Jews, he was absolutely ripped to shreds with every yeah. anti-Semitic cliche. You know, these are the people who killed our Lord and. You know, he should go back to the Spanish Inquisition, and then he does. And it's it's just so amazing to keep on remembering what was going on in the world yeah, at the time. For sure, right? And kind of like again, like on both sides. Like, like I think this is also what 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 pushes Jews to kind of speak up. So, and we'll see that later on. If they're saying this is basically a Phil Hashem, like to have someone get up and say, you know, like slavery is is the, is the Jewish way or the Torah way that all or that what the Bible says. And again, people felt very strongly. Like, we have to get up and say like this isn't this isn't true. This isn't really what we believe. Um, so thank you for for sharing that. Um, if you want to throw your hands. Yeah. It's interesting that um, neither, particularly Rabbi Raphael, but uh, obviously his first time, that neither of them refer to Hazal. Like it's right. an argument from Tanakh, as if, you know, that the eye for an eye, Hazal understood to be Pesach, whereas slavery they understood to edit Nami to be real, not, you know, metaphor. Right. So, so I couldn't imagine a rabbi today getting up and not quoting Hazal as right. part of the uh, an analysis of. Right. No, that's actually, before he does bring up like the Ram a little bit, we'll talk about at the end, like how it tries to, like I think there are certain things that Hazal tried to kind of like um, frame a little bit, being like it says you can have slaves, but again, like a different like laws that we have. But you're right, like it's interesting that people aren't quoting kind of more Hazal in a sense. Um, yes? Um, I'm going to speculate on something based on what this gentleman said. I'm speculating that, that there was a specific reason he didn't. Several. First of all, you're speaking to the broad mass of people. You want to be as clear and as obvious and go to the, mo the source that they will take most authoritatively, which is Tanakh. The other thing is that you know that non-Jews are, are going to hear this, and they're going to have no clue what you mean if you resort to Talmud. So you must go to the store sources that they revere. It's as more well. kind of a universal kind of like right. text. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yes, you made me think of a question. The same way that like, um, you know, even though the, the Khan of Rabbi Gershon came much later, you know, for Ashkenazim, one marriage. Um, even in the days of the Gemara, they were re recommending you know one husband, one wife. Were there was there much slavery in the days of the you know the Tanaitic period, or was that already gone? Is that, I mean, I would assume, it's just in the context of like Greek and Roman, and Roman that, that, there, that there did exist, you know, the. Ebony, Bria, Ebony, Oh, um, I, I'm not sure about Ebony. Yeah. Again, like, I don't know so much. I can't speak to yeah. um, I just don't know if it, it seems. I, I, I don't remember. Like, Galil had an Ebony, right? Okay, so there were some. Okay. Right. Um, no, so the institution also had to put it in. I was wondering if it was diminishing in that period already oh, or not. That I'm not sure. Right. Um, okay, so I think that what, one kind of point I wanted to add about Phil Friend's background was he actually had come from Hungary and he was part of a, his family in Hungary, he was very involved with the revolution there. So some scholars, again, like talk about how his basically background with, revolution, with this revolution kind of also led him to kind of be more sympathetic to the abolitionists and this idea of kind of like almost, again, like revolutionary sentiments um, in America in America as well. So again, just kind of seeing how people's background and also perhaps their ideology together. Um, turn to page over. Turn out with a few more sources of time that we have. Um, Rabbi David Einhorn, kind of the, also kind of a, uh, one of the major kind of responders for, in this whole scandal that comes up through Rabbi Raphael. He was a reform rabbi um, in Baltimore. Just to give a little bit of background about him, um, basically um, in Baltimore, basically the, um, the community that he was a part of, he, as we'll see, was a very, very anti-slavery, big abolitionist. Um, but the, there was kind of an older community in Baltimore that had very strong economic ties to the South. 
Um, and actually, after he kind of publishes all these, these articles, and he comes out, um, you know, and uh, really partially against slavery, um, there was a riot, actually, in, um, in 1861 by the Southern sympathizers in, uh, in Baltimore, and they target um, his journal, or the Science Journal, and they burn down the office, and he actually has to flee with his family to Philadelphia. Um, and then the synagogue, basically, in Baltimore is like, you can come back, but I'll deny on the condition that you um, agree that you'll never give any speeches about anything inflammatory. Um, and his basically answer is no, and he stays in Philadelphia, basically. It's interesting, like, you know, and again, this idea of kind of like, one of the questions we'll see as we kind of um, get to the final sources is, is this something that Jews really should even be discussing? And we there's some Jewish leaders that say, you know, again, our position as Jews in this democracy is something that we, well, let's not cause, let's not cause trouble. Like, let's make sure the union just stays intact, slavery's really bad, but we're not gonna, let's not, let's just not mess up the union. This idea that maybe we even shouldn't be um, speaking about it, um, this idea that kind of like, do we want to censor, uh, again, at least the question you did else, do we want to censor what we know what people people say, or again, like, we're, we're forbidding opinion, but over here, um, this idea that, that he, again, he, he refused to allow himself to be censored, really wants to, to speak his mind, um, and, and again, refuses to go back to Baltimore, and he, he takes a, a pulpit in um, Philadelphia. Um, and again, also someone who, again, scholars talk about how he was, he was very kind of affected also by the Enlightenment in Europe, and also the, the revolutions that were going in Europe to kind of side a little more with the um, abolitionists. Um, so over here, he kind of um, expands on the idea that we just talked about with, with, with um, Helprin about um, not about reinterpreting kind of troubling texts. Um, he talks a little bit, I think, this idea that the kind of radical texts get restricted by the rabbis. And, I, and again, here he's coming from a very reform perspective, but I, I don't think this is something that is really so foreign in orthodoxy also. Like, we don't do it today, obviously, we don't have a Sanhedrin, but throughout Chazal, like, I think we really do see a lot of times where there are kind of different things that happen in Tanakh or different kind of sets of laws that get radically kind of restricted um, by the rabbis. And, and I will read kind of like his argument here. I think we can think of our own examples um, as well. So basically, paragraph two, um, he talks about, again, I'll just read it quickly, where the question in the beginning, exclusively to be decided is whether scripture merely tolerates this institution as evil, uh, as an evil not to be disregarded, and therefore infuses in its legislation a mild spirit gradually to lead to its dissolution, or whether it favors, approves of, and justifies and sanctions it in its moral aspect. Uh, if we skip down to the, the next part where it's um, where it's bolded, he talks a lot about many different times in, in uh, the Torah where, again, we restrict these kind of radical texts, right? It's the justification of institution, the morality of which Dr. Raphael will scarcely deny, whose propagation or being embarrassed on sought to check through a ban, not to your affirm in the most positive manner, right? He's referring to, uh, to which case over here? To uh, right to right to polygamy, right this idea that like back in the day, all like we, right Raphael's um, uh, response before was like, but the Avot like all had slaves. We could say also the Avot all had multiple wives, but we don't do that anymore either. Right there's there's times when we come up and we make certain taka notes. Um, right, and he goes on. Um, right, it must be conceded that with Mosaic law, as in the case of blood vengeance and the marriage of a war prisoner, here merely tolerate the institution view of once existing deeply rooted social conditions, or more correctly, evils are recognized in the reference to civil rights, um, etc., etc. So I would give, I think, different examples which we see um, things kind of, he's again, come from a reform perspective, but I think different times, whether it be the Goal Hadam, right, that it seems from just the official text, right, the Goal Hadam um, can take revenge, right, on the, anyone who kills um, accidentally, but um, the rabbis are Sakamako, the Lotus in 10th grade, really, really radically kind of limited, whether it's optional, whether it's mandatory, only when it's within the, the only when it's in the, um, the Irmic class, only when, sorry, when it's outside the Irmic class. Um, other examples as well, you can think of Sota, right, the idea that in the Mishnayot, that we add in this whole idea of, of um, having to warn the woman, right, of her having to have been alone with a person, that really from the, the straight biblical text looks more like kind of like a more of a trial by her deal. So again, kind of different times that he's kind of saying that we become limited. Or again, another, I think Mark, we went here in 10th grade, also one talks about capital punishment, right? We see in, uh, towards the end of the first paragraph of Masach and Maklod, Rabbi Kira and Rabbi Tarfon talk about how they had been alive right in the time period when they had uh, been deciding capital cases. They never would have executed anyone. And again, kind of, uh, again, we see that there's, there's times when just because uh, something seems to, have to be an option, in Tanakh or in, in Humash, like the Chazal again, um, sometimes find their way, um, I don't want to say rounded, but like we'll sometimes limit it, we'll limit that certain idea. Um, and again, so this is again like one of his um, responses here to Raphael is that, again, do we take texts li literally that are, that are disturbing to us? Do we try to kind of reinterpret it? Um, and again, just kind of to, to wrap up kind of this, and then we'll, we'll open if anyone has, has more comments on it, um, towards the last paragraph as well. Um, uh, this is like the last thing that I wanted to, uh, to talk about. Really, um, Rabbi Einhorn, we spoke before about union versus slavery. 
And Einhorn, kind of his approach is that our position as Jews in, um, in America at this time is only protected as long as have slavery will cease to exist. And he kind of talked about this idea that if right now, how can we be safe as a minority if we allow kind of other people to be subjected or other people to be persecuted against? And if you look at we'll turn the page over. Um, he talks about this a little bit in the, the last paragraph. Um, the Jew has special cause to be conservative, and he is doubly and triply so in a country which grants him all the spiritual and material privileges he can wish for. He wants peace at every price and travels for the preservation of the union like a true son for life of a dangerously sick mother. So on one hand, we, we care about this country so much, and we, we don't want to go to war. Um, but at the same time, um, there's this idea that sometimes certain things are so terrible that we have to stand up. And this idea that perhaps our, our position as Jews here really, really requires us to, if we want to become, not just because of the moral outrage, but if we want to be safe, it can only be in a society where there's true justice and, and true democracy for everyone. Um, just kind of the last line again, this goes back to the Phil Hashem argument, but to proclaim slavery and Judaism to be God's sanctioned institution, the Jewish religious press must raise objections to this. If it does not want itself in Judaism, granted, granted for it. So again, here it's saying kind of like slavery does not trump the, um, sorry, the unit does not trump slavery, and, and really we have to kind of to get up and, and, and really kind of fight against this. Um, any, any thoughts about, any, anyone want to share any thoughts about this source? Anything else? Responses, yes. Um, I, I, I'm thinking of the larger topic, it feels like how little has changed in the sense that there was always going to be the struggle. I think um, uh, for most of us, we, we have a guiding viewpoint that, that you know, we don't want it to happen to us, therefore you cannot let it happen to someone else. Um, but the sense that you are always something of an alien in, a, in a, 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 a majority culture that is quite different. Um, it may give you extra responsibilities, but you also have to take extra care. Um, and thinking back as uh, being old, significantly older than your students, and thinking back to being in um, less urban, living in less urban areas in America in the 50s, uh, when one took care not to um, make your Jewishness a for um, outside people to be too interested, too terribly interested in it. And that that, uh, that is not so far back in our past. No, it's true. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so I, I think what we've seen kind of so far, I was kind of, if you want to turn the page over, we're going to kind of look at a few more sources in the last uh, five, ten minutes here. Um, just I think to, to recap a little what we saw before, just to put a little bit of greater context. Um, so, so far we saw, again, our bigger bells kind of approach, um, to kind of start this whole controversy. We spoke a little bit about how, um, uh, gave some examples of kind of rabbis in the north, again, that were um, more kind of decided with the abolitionists, were very kind of against slavery, were, were wanted to go to, felt it was important to go to war um, over this. And we saw um, already really David Einhorn is really kind of that's a major person, right, really from Baltimore, Philadelphia, was kind of the reform rabbi leading, leading this concern. Um, what I want to show you now is there were some kind of rabbis in the South, though, who also um, felt the opposite. And we'll talk a little about them, and then the final thing that we'll see is the rabbis were kind of in the middle position. Again, I'm only giving you a few sources, a lot more. But Pardon me in the interruption. Ninth and 10th graders, please join us in the Beit Knesset right away. Okay. Um, so again, if we look at the uh, page six now, there were some rabbis in the South who surprisingly um, very much were fine with slavery. And again, this is not, again, Rabbi Raphael was someone from the North, and we had this whole kind of great debate even in our group over, you know, how much did he know, how much did he not know. But rabbis in the South were very much knew what was going on. Um, and I think it can sometimes be a little bit shocking to see kind of like the support that they had. But yeah, I think just to put in this greater context, just put into context by different scholars, whether it's Korn, whether it's um, Sarna talking about, again, that really part of life in the South, or, or buying into life in the South, meant buying in to being okay with slavery. Um, and again, it didn't mean that you were running like a terrible plantation and abusing your slaves, but it meant that part of being accepted as a Jew in the South meant that you were, to a certain extent, okay with this. Um, so one example, we look at um, Source F, uh, Rabbi Bernard, uh, Bernard um, Lowry, who was an old, kind of like, German um, Orthodox rabbi in Baltimore, so kind of like the opposite a little bit of, uh, of Einhorn, to a certain extent. Um, he, again, publishes, uh, again, this, uh, one, of his, one of his sermons on, a, on this fast day about um, a little bit of, uh, again, we'll see very pro-slavery, and actually, once it got spread around, 
people who were also pro-slavery were impressed by this. And he actually gets offered um, a pulpit job in New Orleans. That like he basically asked to come down and say, oh, like again, you're a Baltimore and like you're still pro-slavery. Like we actually might want you to, to come down and be uh, be a rabbi for us in this uh, in this state. Interesting. Um, so you look at the bolded parts over here. Um, again, I think this was mentioned by, by a few people, that really there was a tremendous kind of distrust also of the abolitionists. That who are these people who are saying that like we have to kind of get rid of slavery? And again, there was a lot of kind of distrust, um, again, seeing like who they were kind of linked with. A lot of the abolitionists, they were, they were linked to um, uh, different uh, Christian, Christian evangel evangelists, or also certain Protestant ministers that had a little bit of anti-Semitic um, approach as well. So there was, really, really was this kind of like distrust with who's kind of forcing America to go to war over this. Like who exactly are we siding with as Jews? Um, it says over here, and who can blame our brethren of the South for seceding from a society whose government cannot or will not protect the property rights and privileges of a great portion of the Union against the encroachments of a majority misguided by some influential, ambitious aspirants and selfish politicians? Right? They're like, like again, like they're they're not. Uh, what they're, they're all doing this for their self-interest. Like we can't really trust the people who are so against slavery. Um, and again, then he just kind of restates some of the arguments made by um, by Raphael. I just pulled this part of it again. That like, um, if really the Bible was so, or even Moses was so um, was so against uh, so against slavery. Why did we? Why didn't he come up with a law saying that like? Or why doesn't say in the Bible that, like? Why isn't it outlawed? Or why wasn't there a point where people kind of freed the slaves, right? Where was there ever a greater philanthropist than Abraham? Why did he not set the, uh, free the slaves, for which the king of Egypt made a present of, right? Earlier on, or even later on, why did Ezra not command the Babylonian exiles who were returning to their old country? How did they receive 7,337 slaves? Set their slaves free and send them away. Right, so again, really, why, why? Where do we see this command? No one, no one ever comes up and tells us to free our slaves. So again, kind of one approach we see over here. Um, and the second thing I want to show you also, right after that, Rabbi Max Michael ba uh, Bacher, um, who was a rabbi in Richmond, um, Virginia. So again, very, um, very connected to the South. Um, and his prayer also, he actually has a special prayer for the Confederacy. And we see over here, really, it wasn't just this idea um, of whether or not really supporting slavery, but really just. Part of living in the South means that you support the South. Um, this is a very famous, uh, very famous village. Actually, in the back, I gave you a picture of it. Um, a friend of mine um, went to visit the museum. Of, yeah, museum of the Confederacy, Richmond, Virginia. And you have the prayer right um, in the back. Of the picture of the ground on the last page of the prayer for the, um, for the for the soldiers. And if you look in the the text, we'll the text on section G. Um, the special tefillah that he says again, we approach thee, O God of Israel. Thus, a single meaning of part as a whole congregation of all the people of land. The men servants and the maid servants thou hast given unto us. The enemy are attempting to seduce, that they too may turn against us, whom thou hast appointed over them as instructors in thy wise dispensation. So just quickly, um, really, what, what what are the assumptions that he's making kind of in this to be love? About, about owning slaves, or about slavery in general? Um, yeah. It kind of seems like he's saying that like, the slaves actually kind of want to be with them, and they're like, cool of it. But these like northerners are like seducing them into thinking that they think we have like other lives and other options, and uh, and that God gave them the slaves and the northerners are trying to seduce the slaves. Right, almost that right thing. That God has given us. Power. Members right. of the respect committee, we are having a meeting today during um, lunch okay, at the so library. Now, because of the different up. programs um, that are going on during the Hanefa versus lunch. There will be two meetings. There will be a ninth and 10th grade respect committee meeting for those of you who have lunch during one period, and there will be an 11th and 12th grade respect committee meeting for those of you who would have the program during the other period. I'm trying to accommodate everyone and show respect for your needs. Thank you. Uh, okay, so for our final few minutes, just to kind of wrap up, the two points I want show about this this is Kila, really that, that's written here is first of all I think that like one of the themes that we see a lot in the South is like this this fear of a slave uprising, which I think we see here it almost like protect us from the slaves. And also this really like, calls them slaves, it calls them what? Man. Right? Man service, maid service, so other scholars have said also like again this is part of this idea in the South, like slavery was seen almost like a like this is like a mercy. Like we're civil we're civilizing like the like the black the black people or black men. And again, like really this like terrible, you know, the the attitude, but again, that was an attitude that existed that, that really came with their school load as well. Uh, our last few minutes I just wanted to kind of summarize the middle approach. And we saw already how people in the South 
really um, side with the South. Again, it could be because of um, just like economic ties. Just that's, that's what it meant to live in the South at the time. People in the North who felt that you know um, our position as Jews maybe requires us to kind of fight against slavery to make sure that we're protected. But there was a middle approach as well. An example I gave there was Rabbi Isaac Mayer Weiss. He's a very famous reform rabbi in, in uh, Cincinnati. Cincinnati also had strong economic ties to the South, and he basically has a little bit more of a, of a compromise attitude. Um, we don't really have time to go through all these sources, but I'll just kind of summarize them. There's this idea that basically for him the most important thing as Jews is to preserve the union. That slavery may be terrible, but we have to make sure it's almost the opposite approach that we saw before, that for us to stay protected, there's like think about what was going on really in Europe at that time, and again the already uh, Enlightenment starting, but again, this idea that there are no ghettos in the United States. We're protected here. And the most important thing for us really slavery is terrible, but, but we have to make sure the union survives, that this kind of oasis of a country that really can protect the Jewish people, this is this is really something that, that's the most important. And really, um Freddie goes he talks about the fanatics and the of the country. We turn the page over on our final page, it says over here, right? We can, and he also talks about if war would come, it would also lead to a terrible situation of what would be happening with Jews who live on both sides of the border, or both sides of the line. They're, they're, right, they're going to end up fighting one another. He says we do not, um, right, um, not only because we abhor the idea of war, but also we have dear friends and near relations, beloved kinsmen in either section of the country. Therefore, silence must henceforth be our policy. And his idea is most important to really just be silent. And let's not talk about, let's make sure that, you know, hopefully it won't come to a war, and let's not make such a, you know, a huge kind of outcry, no matter how terrible slavery slavery may be. Um, so I think just to, just to recap these ideas, I, I think really it's a fascinating way to look at kind of social history, to look at um, how, again, different people look at different aspects of the, of the Bible to support their positions. Um, again, uh, we have a, a situation where, again, something that maybe was fine in the ancient Near East times, or even a time period of the Gemara, all of a sudden you have a social issue that clashes with kind of the values going on at that time, and how the, the religious leaders at that time really struggled, I think, with, you know, how do we, again, do we take, how do we re reinterpret troubling texts, do we not? Do we look at the tradition that we have, even right, in, in Fazal and Gemara, of kind of the, the rabbis who limit certain texts that bother us or not, um, whether it comes to our Orthodox versus Reform, whether it comes to our economic ties in the South or not. Um, and how Please exactly excuse the last interruption for the day of study. Thank um, you so much to everyone who joined us. Day of study is now over. Seniors, please come to room um, 240. So, yeah, I think it's really uh, an, an interesting thing to look at. The last thing I heard you look at your own uh, excerpt from Rabbi Sachs, where it talks about slavery in general and how really God kind of leaves it up to us. So why would the Torah outlaw slavery to begin with? Because it's up to us and Jews to kind of realize at a certain point that slavery is wrong. Thank you so much for coming.